Hey everyone, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're having an amazing day and thanks so much for joining me for another art video. In today's tutorial, I'm gonna be taking you through my entire process for this mixed media realistic pizza slice illustration that I created by combining traditional watercolor paint, watercolor pencils, and I also brought in a tiny bit of white wash. I'll be taking you through my entire process, starting with how I create my preliminary pencil sketch. Then I'll be moving on to sharing the watercolor techniques that I like using to develop that initial layer of color. We'll be allowing that to dry. And then we're gonna be switching on over to using watercolor pencils. And I'm gonna be sharing my techniques that I like using with this medium, as well as how I like doing my layering to develop a wide range of values so that I can make something look more realistic. For this one, I'm also going to be doing some subtle splattering using both my watercolor paint as well as my white gouache. I'll be sharing a little method that I like using in order to protect certain sections of my piece when I am doing my splattering where I don't want my splattering to get on. And we're also going to be finishing this one up by adding some final white highlights using the white gouache. Before jumping in, I wanna let you guys know that I'll be leaving the link to the reference photo that I used for this pizza slice down below in the description box of this video in case you'd like to go ahead and download it and work alongside me. All right, so without much further ado, let's go ahead and jump straight into the sketching process. So right here on the top left, I'm gonna be sharing my reference photo with you. And I found this great pizza slice photo over on pexels.com and it was taken by photographer Sydney Troxell. As always, I'm using an HB drawing pencil to create my preliminary sketch. And I like sketching very, very lightly because of a few different reasons. Number one, I wanna make sure that I'm able to erase my mistakes easily and refine my drawing as I go. Number two, I don't personally like being able to see my pencil work through my paint at the end. And number three, I don't wanna scratch or damage my watercolor paper. Another thing you'll notice is that I use my dry little absorbent towel that I'm gonna be using for my painting process to sweep off the eraser bits after I erase anything out. And this is because I don't wanna use my hand to sweep off those eraser bits because I can have lotion or some sort of oil in my hand or even graphite, and I can run the risk of dirtying up my paper or getting oils on my paper and then what happens is that the paint doesn't uh, sit on that paper and gets absorbed into that paper the same way and I can even create splotchiness and things like that because of the unevenness present on the surface of the paper. I'm also constantly doing my best to not entirely rest my hand on my paper and just touch it very minimally if I have to. All right, so in terms of my sketching process, I do the exact same thing that I always do that I've explained in past sketching tutorials, which I'll make sure to link to a couple of them down below in which I go over my entire drawing process a lot more in depth. But I always like working from general largest shapes, then I make my way towards the medium sized shapes, and then finally I add in smallest shapes and details. It's all about simplifying the process for myself and really seeing everything as simple shapes, as well as constantly comparing the different parts, making up the whole in terms of length, width, location, angles created, etc. By tuning out the details and focusing on the largest general shapes first, I'm better able to utilize my drawing space and make sure that my final illustration is gonna be exactly where I want it to be and in the size that I want it to be. And this also helps me arrive at great proportions with those larger shapes and then the medium shapes before going in with smaller shapes and details and stressing about those smaller things. Once I got in all of the important shapes and the different elements in this pizza slice, I also mapped out certain sections where I found color changes in the photo and also some sections of light areas that I wanna make sure to keep protected throughout the painting process 
where I wanna make sure that I have plenty of that white paper shining through to help me transmit those lightest values because this is the way that we create light values with watercolor. We have to make sure that we are incorporating the whiteness and the brightness of the paper under the paint that we use so that we can combine the translucency or the transparency of this painting medium with the paper underneath in order to develop those lightest values. And of course, when we wanna create bright highlights, we can leave those sections of paper completely unpainted so that that whiteness can stand in place for those very bright highlights. However, with this piece, I'm not gonna worry about the brightest highlights so much because I knew since the beginning that I would be bringing in my white gouache at the very end. Once I'm happy with my sketch, I switch on over to my kneaded eraser and I gently tap over my entire sketch to lighten the sketch a little bit more before getting started with the painting process, as well as remove any excess graphite that might be floating around on my paper, which may end up muddying my vibrant color that I'm gonna be applying next. All right, so it is time to get started with preparing my first few color mixtures that I'm gonna be needing for my initial layer that I'm gonna be creating with traditional watercolor paint. So this is my watercolor set from Daniel Smith, and I'm gonna be using six different colors for this part of the painting process. And these colors are Deep Scarlet, Mew Gamboge, Yellow Ochre, Burnt Sienna Light, Neutral Tint, and Undersea Green. I wanna stress here that you by no means have to use the exact same colors that I'm gonna be using. As long as you use something that's similar, you're gonna be perfectly fine. I'm making sure that I'm preparing nice juicy color mixtures on my color mixing palette, approximately 50% paint, 50% water in them, so that they have a good amount of color saturation, but some amount of flow in them as well and that I have a good amount of paint on there on my palette ready to go. Because what I'm gonna be doing in the very first part of this process is I'm gonna be pre-wetting the entire pizza slice shape with water. And while that shape is still wet, I'm gonna be doing all of my color work and initial value development in the entire pizza slice in one same go. And I don't want any section of the pizza slice to start drying on me way too fast because I have to create more of any of my different color mixtures. And if I do run out of any of my colors or I need to alter the ratios of the different colors in any one of my mixtures, I make sure to do it very quickly along the way. All right, so I'm using my size 16 round brush to create these initial color mixtures. As you can see, I'm taking just a bit of water at a time from my container, removing the excess water by gently scraping the bristles of my paintbrush along the top of my container every time I'm going in there. And I'm swiveling my paintbrush in my paint, bringing out a little bit of paint at a time into my different color mixtures. If I need to add a little bit more fluidity or more water into my color mixtures, I simply take a little bit of water from my container and bring it in. And if I need to make that color look a little bit more saturated or I need to thicken up my paint a little bit more, I bring out a little bit more color into that mixture. So let me go ahead and explain what these initial colors that I have here are. Starting at the left that is just burnt sienna light with some water in it. Underneath that and slightly to the right I have my deep scarlet with a little bit of water in it. Right above that I have a mixture of deep scarlet with a little bit of neutral tint to darken it. Then on the right section of my mixing palette I have on the top left a mixture of burnt sienna light plus a little bit of neutral tint which of course makes it into a darker brown. And I have two yellow looking puddles there. The one below the dark brown is just plain yellow ochre with some water in it. And above that and to the right, I have a mixture of yellow ochre plus new gamboge. New gamboge is a very bright, warm yellow. Now I will be bringing in a bit of undersea green at the very end of this process when it's time to do some subtle splattering with watercolor. I didn't actually prepare any undersea green for myself right now because I'm not gonna be requiring it until much later. But right at the top there on my mixing palette, you can see a bit of that undersea green in a dry state. 
I will say that this is by no means all of the paint that I'm going to be using throughout this initial phase of the painting process. And of course, as with all watercolor painting processes, it is a lot about shifting and changing both the ratios of your colors in your color mixtures, as well as the paint to water ratios in your mixtures, depending on what it is that you need in that given point in time in the painting process. The more you practice your watercolor painting, the more intuitively you start reaching for whatever color it is that you need to add in or add more water or whatever it is that you need to do. All right, you guys, with my color mixtures ready to go for me, it is time to get started with pre-wetting our entire pizza slice. So I switched on over to a flat brush and this is 3 fourths of an inch in size. And I am using my water to pre-wet the entire pizza slice. Really take your time with the pre-wetting process. Make sure that you arrive at a nice even sheen all throughout the pizza shape. I'm bringing out a little bit of water at a time from my container, making sure that I am not bringing out too much at a time and dripping water all over the place and gently gliding the bristles of my paintbrush over the entire shape four, five, six times. If you find that you accidentally bring out way too much water and it's puddling in any section of your watercolor paper, Simply remove the excess water from your paintbrush bristles by blotting your bristles on your absorbent towel and then go in and use the bristles of your paintbrush like a little absorbent sponge and that is going to help you lift up that excess water. You definitely don't want any puddles anywhere. You're looking for evenness here. Make sure that you go over everything a few times and it's really going to depend on the environment that you're working in because if you're working in a warm environment, a cold environment, a humid environment, a dry environment, if you have a heating system on or a fan or air conditioning, all of these things are going to have a huge impact on how quickly your paper dries. And you definitely don't want any section of this shape starting to dry on you way too fast. This is exactly why we're doing pre-wetting so that we can expand the working time that we have. Whenever we start painting on dry paper, well, that paper is thirstier and it's going to absorb that paint much faster, which is going to make it so that we are racing against the clock. And I really want to give myself time to develop all of the different colors and values with this initial layer with traditional watercolor paint before anything starts to dry on me way too fast. I wanna do it all in one same layer. Aside from giving us more working time, pre-wetting our watercolor paper is also helpful because we are ensuring that we get nice diffused out soft effects because that water content that we have prepared our paper with is doing half of the work for us and it's really gonna help create nice blurred out effects. It's gonna help the paint expand out into the paper and also create nice transitions between my different colors. If I were working on dry paper, I would be left with hard defined edges around the shapes that I paint in. That paint wouldn't expand out. So pre-wetting is an excellent choice whenever you're going to be working, especially on those initial layers and especially when the shapes or areas that you're painting in are relatively large. All right, so let's go ahead and have some fun with this color development here in the layer that we're going to be creating with traditional paint. The first color that I dropped in was the color that I created by mixing together my new gamboge plus yellow ochre. After that, what you're going to see me drop in right here is my yellow ochre with no other color added in. And you can see how I'm dropping in just a bit of color at a time and I'm being very irregular about where I drop in my color. Taking clues and ideas from that reference photo but I'm not really trying to copy it exactly. I'm just getting clues from that reference. What's cool about painting something like a pizza slice is that there is a ton of irregularity and even imperfection all throughout the pizza slice. And this means that there is a large margin for error and for us being able to have fun when we're developing these values and these colors all throughout the pizza slice as long as it makes sense with the structure of what it is that we're painting 
and the textures present and the important characteristics about pizza that we're trying to describe here so that we arrive at higher levels of realism. But what I'm getting at is try not to be overly perfectionistic and allow the paint to do its own thing. All right, so I dropped in some of my dark brown, which was the mixture of burnt sienna light plus neutral tints here and there along some of the edges of the pizza slice, especially where I visualize crispier or almost uh, burnt sections of that crust or bread to be. And after doing that, I got started with my orangish red and then I'm gonna be moving on to my darker reds. So I actually decided to add in a little bit of new gamboge very quickly into my deep scarlet on my mixing palette before going in and adding deep scarlet by itself. And this is a decision that I made very quickly because deep scarlet is a very dark red and I just wanted to create a kind of transition step between the yellows that I had already placed on my paper and this very dark red by creating an orange in between the yellow and the red. I like working in steps gradually, incrementally towards darker colors as much as possible when I'm working with watercolor. This gives me a little bit more control. All right, so after dropping in that orange here and there in a very irregular way, essentially placing that orange where I saw visible tomato sauce sections in that reference photo, I then added more of my deep scarlet into my orange color mixture to deepen it and make it redder. And then I'm dropping more of this darker red color into certain sections where I see darker reds in that photo. So sections where I have even more of that tomato sauce. And I'm also gonna get started with painting in the pepperoni. By dropping in a little bit of this darker red on top of a few of those orange sections that I already developed, I deepen and darken certain sections inside of those larger orange shapes, creating a larger variety of reddish orange and red values. And this is gonna make it look more realistic. We always wanna make sure that we're thinking of developing a wide range of values. And all I mean with this is you wanna make sure that you have certain sections of all your different colors that you're using that are lighter and more translucent and other sections in which those colors are darker and more saturated. Something else that I want you to notice at this point is there is plenty of white paper shining through in many sections throughout this pizza slice, especially in the cheesy sections and also in some sections inside of the pepperoni where you see a lot of little bright highlights in that photo because of the oiliness. I continue dropping in only a bit of color at a time and after I feel I've placed enough color, I remove the color from my paintbrush bristles and I go in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush to gently move and distribute that same color that I've already applied on paper, expand it out a little bit to soften it wherever I feel I need to. And sometimes I even go in and do some lifting with the bristles of my paintbrush, using them as a little absorbent sponge to pick up excess color from my paper and reveal more of that brightness of that paper underneath to help me add dimension back into an area and make sure that I'm staying away from flatness. Right here, you're gonna see me do a lot of lifting of excess color that I've placed on paper. And this is very important. It's important to incorporate that whiteness, that brightness of the paper under the paint, especially because the cheese is a very, very light yellow, almost off-white looking color. And if you want that to be very light at the end, you wanna make sure that you're playing with the medium's translucency and that you're incorporating that brightness underneath so that it can help you create those lighter, values for the cheese. You wanna really observe that photo and kind of pinpoint darkest value areas and then mid-tones and then lightest value areas because those are the different values that you're trying to create with your different colors. And value really is number one when it comes to developing higher levels of realism. Right here, for example, I am dropping in my darkest red, which is my deep carmine plus a little bit of neutral tint in sections of deepest, darkest reds that I'm able to see in that reference photo, but I'm only placing it in those darkest red sections. If you place your paint in a very thick, saturated state all throughout the pizza slice, 
then you're probably going to end up with something that looks very heavy, very flat. It's not going to have much dimension to it. At this point in the process, the entire pizza shape is still pretty wet and workable. And the reason this is, is because I took the time to do that pre-wetting before getting started. If I hadn't taken the time to do that pre-wetting, certain sections would already be in that awkward semi-dry state and I wouldn't be able to continue working. But since I did take my time to do that pre-wetting, I can still continue working a little bit more. I can still drop in color wherever I want to deepen and darken or make that color look a little bit more saturated and I can still go in and do lifting wherever I need to. All right, so I'm pretty happy with how everything is looking and my paper is starting to dry at this point. So I'm about to call this part of the process done. I'm just finishing by doing some quick lifting of excess paint and then I'm gonna allow everything to dry completely before getting started with the next part of this process, which is going to be the watercolor pencils. I help myself with a hair dryer to speed up the drying process. You definitely want to make sure that the entire piece is completely dry before getting started with your watercolor pencils. I'm going to be using a total of seven different colors from my watercolor pencil set from Faber Castell. This is from their Gold Faber Aqua line. And these seven colors are Permanent Carmine, Cadmium Yellow, Burnt Ochre, Van Dyke Brown, Dark Chrome Yellow, Dark Chrome Orange, and Indian Red. Just like what I was mentioning with the watercolor paint, you do not have to use these exact same colors that I'm going to be using as long as you use something that's similar. Your piece is going to look great. Essentially what I made sure to do is to prepare at least a couple of different yellows, a lighter and a darker yellow, a few different reds, a darker red, a medium red, and a lighter red, and a couple of different browns, a lighter brown and a darker brown. With this, I knew that I would set myself up for success in order to create a wide variety of different values, lights, midtones, and darks for all of these different elements and sections of this pizza slice, which as I said, value is really number one. All right, so with that initial part of the process that we did with the watercolor paint, what we were starting to do with that first layer of color was to start developing a wide range of values and also to develop an underpainting that starts establishing all of these different color sections throughout the pizza slice. The objective with this second phase in the painting process, which is our watercolor pencil phase, is going to be to make certain colors look a little bit more vibrant, especially the yellows and the light orange sections and also to deepen and darken darker midtone sections and darkest dark sections. In this part of the process, we're gonna be leaving plenty of sections untouched, uncovered with watercolor pencil, especially the lightest areas that I was talking about before with the cheese. We can also use one of the strengths of watercolor pencils to develop a higher amount of visual texture in certain areas where we could benefit from that kind of texture. So for example, the bread and the pepperoni and leave more of a smooth painterly effect in sections of more liquidy sauce or the cheese. So what I am doing here is I am working section by section and I am making sure, as I said, to leave plenty of my underpainting shining through especially in lighter value sections. And all I am doing is I am using the watercolor pencil colors that go hand in hand with the colors underneath that I've already developed with watercolor paint. So for example, I started at the top with the crust and for the crust, I had already used yellow, I had used lighter brown and I had used a darker brown in a few edges here and there when it came to my traditional watercolor paint. So those are the same colors that I used when it came to my watercolor pencils in that same area. I added a little bit of cadmium yellow to brighten certain sections where I had already painted in some yellow. I added in some burnt ochre, which is a light brown in light brown sections that I had already developed with watercolor paint. And then I switched on over to my darkest brown, which is my Van Dyke brown. And I added that darker brown in certain dark brown sections that I had already developed with watercolor paint. I'm not pressing down 
down hard at all. I am just working on overlapping color and saturating color a little bit more, especially in darker mid-tone sections and darkest dark sections in each area throughout the pizza slice where I'm really looking to push darker value areas. Once I was done with that work in the crust, I took my dark cadmium orange, my permanent carmine, and my Indian red. I started with the lightest color of the bunch, which in this case is my cadmium orange, and I started layering that orange on orangish sections that I had already started developing with my watercolor paint. What I have in my hand right now is the permanent carmine, and as you can see, I am using it to do some overlapping of this medium red in darker mid-tone red sections that I'm looking to deepen and darken inside of the pepperoni slices and also other sauce sections outside of the pepperoni. After this one, I'm gonna be switching on over to my darkest color of the bunch, which in this case is the Indian red. And I'm only going to be applying the Indian red, doing some overlapping with this darkest red in sections of darkest red values that I'm looking to push even more. The darker the color I have in my hand, the more mindful I am of only using that color in darkest value sections that I'm looking to darken inside of the larger mid-tone color shape. So in other words, the darker the color, the smaller the shape that I am creating with it, or the smaller the shape of overlapping color that I'm creating with it. Once I have gone through that sequence of lightest color, then medium color, then darkest color, if I wanna go back to the lighter color or the medium one to do a little bit more overlapping of color or maybe even work on transitions between darker colors to lighter colors, I can go ahead and do that. Focus on layering and adding more color saturation in areas of darker midtones and darkest darks and areas of lighter values and lightest lights you're looking to leave alone with no more color at all or with a very small amount of color. I continue working section by section, taking the group of colors that I need for the section on hand and then working from lightest color of the bunch towards the darkest color of the bunch. Alongside this, if you're looking for higher levels of realism, it's very important that you acknowledge different value shapes as being abstract, irregular shapes. And also stay away from the look of obvious outlines around any of these elements throughout the pizza slice. You definitely don't want to start outlining around the pepperoni pieces or along the crust or anything like that because that's gonna take away from the higher levels of realism. In realism, there are no outlines. If I wanna add contrast and definition, in the pepperoni slices, for example, I only go over certain sections of those edges. Or what I do is I actually create a curved elongated red shape outside of the pepperoni slice and not inside. And I just do that along certain sections outside or inside of that pepperoni slice. At no point in time am I going in and outlining around the entire pepperoni. And I'm still not really pressing down too hard, but whenever I wanna work on transitions in which a darker value is turning into a lighter mid-tone or a light value, I definitely make sure to exert less pressure as I move away from that darker value shape. Wherever I'm looking to just simply make the color look a little bit more vibrant, but it's actually a light value, like for example, the bright yellows, I am not adding in very much color at all, and I'm definitely not pressing down hard at all. After doing my work with those reds, I then switched on over to using my two yellows and also the orange. And what I'm doing with these lighter colors is I am pushing lighter mid-tone sections in the cheese section, especially around the pepperoni pieces where I really want to work on orange mid-tones. And I also want to make those bright yellows a little bit more vibrant in the oily sections. That's where I'm using my yellows. So for this part of the process, I'm really switching between my cadmium yellow, my dark chrome yellow, and also my dark cadmium orange. With my yellows and my orange, because these are lighter colors, I can apply them a little bit more freely, but I still want to make sure that I'm not mindlessly applying even these lighter colors in the cheese sections where I really am looking to keep those sections 
just with that painterly effect created with that initial layer of traditional watercolor paint. I definitely don't want to start mindlessly covering that up because remember, those are sections where we want plenty of that whiteness and brightness of the paper to keep shining through. So a less overlapping of color is done in those very light, almost white sections. Right here, you can see me do some overlapping with my orange on top of my reds and some sections of the pepperoni. And also outside, the orange is very helpful because it helps integrate everything together. And it also helps soften transitions between darker red value areas and lighter yellow areas or areas where you're not gonna be adding in any watercolor pencil at all. You can really create those transitions between the watercolor pencil sections into the watercolor paint sections by using your yellows and your oranges and just exerting a less amount of pressure on your pencil as you make your way out into areas where you don't want any watercolor pencil in. Just exert less and less pressure as you make your way out. All right, so I'm all done with that first application of watercolor pencil pigment. Notice how I have a lot of that initial underpainting shining through completely uncovered with watercolor pencil, especially in sections of cheese and saucy sections where I can really benefit from that painterly look. I decided to use my size 10 round brush to work on this activation of color that I've just applied with my watercolor pencils in the previous phase. And you really just need a small amount of water to do that activation of color when it comes to watercolor pencils. I am taking just a bit of water at a time from my plastic container there. And you can notice how I am constantly blotting the bristles of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel to stay on top of water control. At no point do I wanna bring out a ton of water from my container or start dripping water all over the place and having an absorbent towel on hand or a regular kitchen paper towel is gonna to help you do that. So I'm working section by section and gently running the bristles of my paintbrush over that area where I just applied that watercolor pencil pigment and you can see how as I activate this watercolor pencil pigment, the color is becoming more vibrant, even darker in some cases. And because we're activating this color with a paintbrush and water, we are creating a bit more of a painterly look, but there's still a little bit of that texture created with the pencils left behind. I'm being very loose as I'm doing this activation. I'm pressing down my paintbrush in different ways. Sometimes I'm just using the tip of my paintbrush. Other times I'm pressing down the belly of my paintbrush. If it's a larger uh, color shape that I'm activating, it depends on the size of the shape that I'm activating, but you can really explore and play around with different angles at which you're using your paintbrush, pressing it down in different ways because this is really gonna help you create that irregularity that you're looking for. A couple of important tips here when activating this watercolor pencil pigment are number one, try to make your way from lighter color towards darker color. Because if you work the other way around from darker color towards lighter color as you're doing that activation, then it's very likely that you're going to bring way too much of that darker color into lighter color sections and you can muddy up your lighter colors or flatten an area out too much because you're gonna get rid of those lighter values and lighter colors by covering up the lighter values with the darker color. So you definitely wanna to try to work from lighter color towards darker colors. And another important tip is really pay attention to how much pigment you're starting to collect in your paintbrush bristles. Because as you continue activating your color, more and more pigment is getting embedded and absorbed into your paintbrush bristles and you're gonna start just having way too much color and pigment and paint in those paintbrush bristles. And this can make it so that you then accidentally, once again, cover up lighter value sections or add in way too much of that watercolor pencil pigment into sections where you really wanted that underpainting created with regular watercolor paint 
to be left alone. Pay attention to how you continue pushing and pulling your pigment around your piece. As I continue doing this activation section by section, I am paying attention to how I'm pushing and pulling that pigment around my paper. And if I start noticing that I'm pulling out way too much color into areas that I really am not looking to darken or I want to keep protected, I immediately remove that paint from my paintbrush bristles, I remove the excess water, and I continue working, just making sure that I have no paint in my bristles anymore. If at any point in time you do accidentally pull too much pigment into a lighter value section, immediately go in with your absorbent towel and do some lifting. Just absorb any pigment you can with your absorbent towel or you can remove that color from your paintbrush bristles, go back in with a clean and slightly damp paintbrush, do some very gentle scrubbing with the bristles of your paintbrush, and then go in with your absorbent towel to do some absorbing of excess pigment. All right, you guys, so it's time to get started with the next part of this painting process. I allowed everything to dry completely before getting started once again with more application of pigment using my watercolor pencils. Once again, I want to remind you guys, it's very, very important that you allow your piece to dry completely. You can help yourself with a hair dryer if you want to speed up that drying process, but you definitely, definitely want to make sure that everything is bone dry before you get started with applying this next layering of pigment that you're going to be doing because wet paper is fragile paper even if it is intended for water soluble mediums and we're going in with pretty sharp pretty uh, hard tips there and you definitely don't want to damage your watercolor paper because you won't be able to take that back not to mention watercolor pencil application is pretty different when you apply it on paper that is dry versus paper that is damp all right, so objective for this part of the process is to add more contrast, to work on deepening and darkening only darkest midtones and darkest dark areas. So you're gonna see me primarily use the darkest colors of the bunch that I've selected for this process, especially the darkest brown and the darkest red. Initially, I did go in with the burnt ochre, which is my light brown in the crust. This was just because I wanted to add a little bit more texture into that crust section. And then I switched on over to my dark brown, which is my Van Dyke brown, and I pushed those crispy, almost burnt sections in the crust a little bit more with that dark brown. But primarily, I am going to work on deepening and darkening darkest value sections, mostly with my darkest red. So right here, you can see me go in with my darkest red, which is my Indian red, and I'm applying it into only darkest sections that I'm able to see in that reference photo. Again, I'm not being overly perfectionistic about it. I'm just getting clues from that reference and really acknowledging and creating those darkest value shapes, making sure that I am seeing them as abstract, irregular shapes, that I'm not outlining anything, and I'm really just looking to push that contrast. At this point, things should really start popping out more because we have really been working on developing that wide range of values from very, very light areas where we have a lot of that whiteness, that brightness of the paper shining through, very translucent color, a very minimal pigmentation, a wide range of mid-tone areas where we have a medium application of pigment. And of course, at this point, we have saturated that color and pushed darker value areas by doing more overlapping of darkest colors. So this wide range of values from very light lights to a wide range of midtones to very dark darks is what leads to higher levels of realism. All right, so after doing that second application of watercolor pencil pigment in darkest value areas, it was time to get started with my next activation of color. So because I really just applied more watercolor pencil in specific areas, this second activation of color should be done relatively quickly because I'm really just looking to activate that color that I just placed. Right here, you're gonna see me do a little bit of scrubbing because I found that I had created a very kind of solid 
uh, same value shape at the top of the pizza there and I just wanted to do some quick scrubbing and removing of pigment to add more dimension into that area by revealing a little bit more of that bright paper in certain sections. So I'm all done with that second activation of color and right here I add a little bit of a sauce effect coming outside of the pizza. I really wanted to do this because I think it makes it look more more realistic and also more interesting. It adds irregularity to the piece. And so all I am doing here is I went back to my traditional watercolor paint and wherever it is that you wanna add in these uh, abstract sauce shapes outside of the pizza shape, all you have to do is use that same color that you were using in that section inside of the pizza shape. Make more of that color if you have to and test it on a scrap piece of watercolor paper to make sure that it is relatively similar to the color that you used inside of the pizza shape in that area where you're gonna be adding that in. And paint in a very abstract, irregular shape with that same color. Initially, I would recommend going in with that same color in a pretty watered down, translucent state. Paint in that abstract shape by pressing down the belly of your paintbrush in different ways so that that can help you create that very abstract, organic, irregular shape. And then with that initial lighter color painted in, you can drop in a little bit more of this color in a slightly more saturated state into certain sections to create a wider variety of values. And that's gonna make that sauce look more realistic. If you wanna soften out any edges, because of course you're painting in these shapes on dry paper, which is going to lead to sharp defined edges, if you wanna soften out any sections of those edges, just remove the paint from your paintbrush bristles and run the clean and slightly damp bristles of your paintbrush over that edge section, and that is gonna soften it. I just recommend making sure to do that while that paint is still wet. All right, you guys, so we are officially in the very last phase of this process, and this is completely optional. This is gonna be the splattering that we do to add in some subtle texture and a little bit of a variety of color as well. I really wanted to add in some specks of green into this pizza slice, even though I don't see any green in the reference photo. I thought that it would be a nice addition of color. So the first thing that I did was I allowed everything to dry completely once again. So what I did was I took a sheet of tracing paper, I placed it on top of my dry painting, I traced over my pizza shape, I cut out that piece of shape, and then I'm gonna place this tracing paper over my painting exactly on top of that pizza shape so that I can get my splattering only inside of the pizza shape. This way I can keep the entire outer section protected with no splattering on it. So what I am doing right here using my size 10 round brush is I am doing some splattering. Initially I went in with my reddish orange color and did some splattering with that and I am now going in with my undersea green and doing flicking motions using my index finger. So if you've never done splattering before, I would highly recommend testing out the color consistency or the consistency of your paint and also the paintbrush itself that you've selected for this process on a scrap piece of paper to make sure that the splattering is coming out nice and fine because both the consistency of your paint has to be helpful and also your paintbrush has to have a snap to it. The bristles have to be snappy so that that flicking motion can be done and the splattering can happen. Once I did my splattering with a couple of different colors using my watercolor paint, it was time to do the splattering and my final addition of white highlights or brightest highlights using my white gouache. For my white gouache, I am using another cheaper multi-purpose brush because I don't like using my watercolor brushes with my gouache because gouache is opaque paint and I don't like to have gouache in my paintbrush bristles when I switch to working with watercolor. Now gouache straight out of the tube tends to be quite thick and you wanna make sure that you have a great consistency that is gonna help you do the splattering. So bring out a little bit of water at a time into your mixer, swivel your paintbrush in there, combining the water with your gouache until the consistency is helpful for you. So I used a size 10 cheap multi-purpose brush to do fine splattering with my white gouache. And right here, I switched on over to a size two multi-purpose brush 
to add in some final bright highlights. I would recommend making sure not to go overboard with the white highlights that you add in with the white gouache because it's super easy to do. And I wanted to make sure that I'm very minimal about this addition of final brightest highlights. Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, make sure to check out everything that I am offering over at my Patreon membership website, because for a very small amount a month, you're gonna get immediate access to my exclusive tutorials, classes, and resources that I don't share anywhere else. All of these exclusive tutorials include my downloadable outline sketches so that you don't have to start from scratch, reference photos, and my supply lists. There's already a library of over 75 sketching and watercolor painting tutorials that are real time, meaning they are not sped up or edited. They are fully narrated. And I take you through my entire process, making sure to explain everything as clearly as possible, step-by-step. Step. Two new exclusive full length tutorials are added into this exclusive library every single month. For those of you who are interested in really taking your artwork to the next level and want to know all of the inside secrets that I learned about in art school and courses that I've invested in myself, there's also a full library on classes on art fundamentals in which all of the bases are covered. That library has now over 35 classes and workshops all have assignments at the end that help you actually put your knowledge to the test. And there's a brand new class or workshop added at the beginning of every single month. As if all of this weren't enough, you also get a weekly sketchbook prompt sent to your inbox to help you stay consistent with your art practice. There's a live training, workshop, or paint along session with me every single month. Members in the $15 tier and upwards get access to thorough feedback from me on their work whenever they need it, and much, much more. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things, which you can choose from depending on your goals and needs needs. So go ahead and check it out. I'm going to make sure to leave a link where you can find out more down below in the description box of this video. And I would love, love, love to get to know more about you and your work and have you join this innermost art community of mine. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.